All right, and we're live. Craig, thank you so much for being here today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I am. I've been looking forward to it all week. I'm. I'm delighted to be here. You know, I've been podcasting for a while, and it's interesting because I'll talk to people that be like, "Hey, I want to start a podcast. I want to do a podcast." And usually, people never do it. And I think we spoke. I don't know, three or four weeks ago. And uh, you're like, yeah, I'm going to start a podcast, and here we are. And I'm. I'm just delighted to be. Uh, you know, early on in your in your roster of guests. So thanks for having me. There's nobody better I could have asked to be on this early. And we'll get into your introduction so everybody knows the value that you're about to bring. Uh, but I think, yeah, it was something about five, no, six weeks ago for sure uh, that we spoke because it was right before my trip. And then I okay. took that trip. I was away for a while, obviously, you know, took a little bit of a hands off from business. And then when I came back, I was like, I got to get to this. And uh, you're actually a second guest we're having on the show. So I'm super excited for this, but for anybody who doesn't know uh, who you are, what you do, what you specialize in, why don't you give us a breakdown of yourself? Sure. Yeah. I, so I, I've had a, 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 I guess, long career in technology um, where I've spent a, a lot of that time as a web developer. And um, during that time, I had an opportunity to start you know, writing for, for books and publishing magazine articles and speaking at conferences and doing all that. And during that sort of season in my career, I had an opportunity to start building online courses. It was funny because I built my first course. I spent so much time doing it. It's just <laughs> so much work the first time. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like three or four months later after it was released, I, I got a check in the mail. And it was like for $4,000. And my wife looked at me. And she's like, maybe you should keep doing this. Like, this seems like a, a, a good idea. And, and so that just built up, 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 up and up from there. And at this point I've had the opportunity to uh, enjoy over $2 million in profits from, from core sales that, that I've built. Um, and I I've, was working with a publisher for a while and they got bought and sold and bought and sold by a couple different peoples. And then they started getting really creative in ways to pay course authors less and less money. So mm -hmm. I kind of realized that, you know, nothing, nothing good lasts forever. So what I wanted to do was figure out like, what's the next stage in my career? What's the next kind of um, turn that I can make in working with evergreen content? And, and that was one of the biggest things that I learned as I built courses was that the ones that I built, even in the technology realm, that had the most impact were the ones that needed the least amount of update continually. So I was like, well, what can I do that's evergreen that can make the biggest impact on the on most amount of people? And so I uh, started helping people learn how to build and launch courses for them. And uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun being able to be involved in that process. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, I want to touch on a lot of what you discussed, and I can definitely relate to a lot of different aspects of it: creating the course, <laughs> putting everything into it. You know, right. first not being sure how it's going to do, then seeing some results. The affirmation from the wife is always great. That That's always a boost right. of encouragement. So that's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can relate to a lot of that. But I want to go a little bit further back because I'm, I'm always really interested in the psychology of human beings. I think that's what, funny enough, drove me into sales. It was really mm -hmm. human psychology. That's what drove me into business for whatever reason. And I mean, a lot of my family is actually in the psychology space. So I guess genetics, nurture, whatever you want right. to call it. Uh, it's family but it's always <laughs> exactly right. Keeping it in, in the family. Uh, it's always been very interesting to me. And um, just looking at biographies, reading books, understanding humans has always been extremely fascinating. That's one of the things I actually speaking of the podcast and launching it that I really want to tackle with this podcast, if anything, for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to really dig deep into all these different individuals, uh, psychologies and see how they succeed. So I want to go back to you being in the tech world and uh, how you even got there. What even got you into tech? Were you always a techie person? Did you just see yourself going that direction? Did you have an inherent advantage? No. <laughs> okay. Not at all. I was never uh, the, a techie kid in school. I spent uh, most of my, my early years uh, on a skateboard or with drumsticks in my hand or a guitar in my hand. And it wasn't until college that I even considered the opportunity to, to get into tech. And in fact, this is, this is kind of how it played out for me. So I, I was in school for nothing that I had any interest in. And I met a really good friend of mine. And at that time, he had forgotten more about computers than it seemed like I would ever, would ever learn in my entire lifetime. And he came over to my house and he cracked open my mom's computer. And he's like, this is the sound card. And this is the modem. And this is the video card. And I was just like, 
you can tell by looking at them, like the difference between, I just completely blew my mind. Right. And for some reason, when we got out of school, he decided to hire me in his computer consulting company, probably more to take pity on me than anything else, because, uh, I, you know, we didn't know what we were going to really do with our lives. Um, and I was just a really bad uh, computer networking, upgrade, repair, PC kind of person until the web hit. And I saw this opportunity to where I could begin to build websites and it gave me the chance to be creative and technical at the exact same time. But That's I had amazing. a huge, yeah. This is, yeah, this it is was a classic it, opportunity means preparation case. Exactly. But I okay. had a problem because I, I, had, I didn't know anything. And I also, you want to talk about the psychological aspects of it. I also had a deep seated belief in my heart that I was never going to be able to become a programmer or a developer or anything even close to that because I hadn't gone to school for it and there was no one around to show me what to do. Mm. And what ended up happening was I started using software to build websites. And then I would, I, I remember the first time that I cracked open the code that was generated and I, I looked at a, a, some programming stuff, it was a loop. And I remember staring at it and thinking like, I will never figure this out. I'll never understand it. Um, but what ended up happening was I bought a book and I poured through that book and I learned a little bit. And from there, I ended up moving into a space to where I was basically a project manager for the web development efforts for uh, the companies that I work for, the, the main one being a, an independent uh, movie studio. And so I would hire the people to do the back end work and, I'd, you know, uh, manage the, the creative work. And I would do all this kind of stuff. And then I got laid off from that job. Mm. But, and I didn't, I had marketable skills, but I wasn't the guy who could build the website from end to end. But I right. had a good friend who said, you know what, you, you can handle this. And so every morning I got, I was laid off for five months. Every morning I got up and went to my desk, just like I had a job. I had a I, you know, young family. My oldest son was 10 months at the time, you know, I've been married for, for a few years or whatever. Got up just like I was going to work, poured through two different books. And I got my first job as a software developer after that. And <laughs> it was at a financial company. I would come home and tell my wife, they're going to realize the, the mistake they made. The imposter syndrome was so heavy at that point. I was just like, they're just going to let me go. Wow. But when it ended up happening was since I had learned all of this new information on the web and I'd learned the contemporary, the new skills, the basic, the cutting technology from what was being taught, you know, in the marketplace. And, and this is really interesting how this plays into to building online courses now. But I, I learned all that st stuff that was uh, cutting edge at the time that when I went into this job with very little experience, I was looked at, an authority is not the right word, but I was, uh, my input, my ideas, and my approach was sought out because I knew the latest technology. Got it. Okay. So, so many questions for you just right there from that piece of the story. Because I feel like this is where a lot of people fall apart, right? A lot of entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, or people that just want to find a better career or, you know, level themselves up in life. They are essentially, as the saying goes, their own worst enemy. So they won't be yeah. waking up every day like they have a job when they don't, right? So where did you, first question, I guess, and we'll talk about imposter syndrome as well. But first question is, where did you find that type of discipline to uh, get up every day and still clock in like you had a job? I think it's a, a couple different motivating factors. So number one, when you have no income and, and you have a, a family to feed, <laughs> that's pretty motivating, yeah. right? So there's that. But I also like I have distinct memories of, of my dad who was a, a corporate restaurateur and he had spent most of his, his years in retail and also managing uh, restaurants. But he had a dream that he wanted to open his own restaurant one day. And he, he created a business plan for his, his barbecue restaurant. And I remember going with him to meet with investors. Um, one time we went to this, like this dude was super rich. I'd never, I'd never met somebody with, with more money than, than this guy at this point. You know, I was probably like nine mm -hmm. years old. So what did I know? Right, but we yeah. went into this, this guy's house and he had a warehouse in the back. And stacked up in these pallets were, were like go-karts, like four or five high. And the, wow. the guy turns to, to my brother and I, he's like, you, you guys want to take a spin on him? And my dad's like, no. 
We're not going to let my voice I'm so disappointed. Right? So instead, he gave us like some uh, souvenir thing or whatever. But it made such a huge impression on me that I, I, I realized that here was my dad taking his dream, talking to strangers, putting himself out there, you know, uh, trying to, to create a reality of something that hadn't existed before. Right. And it didn't, when you're eight, nine years old, you don't really think about it in those terms. But now looking back, I think being able to see my, my mom and my dad have an entrepreneurial spirit that unfortunately never panned out. Like in any of the businesses they tried, they, they never succeeded in what they were doing. And it's interesting when you talk about the, the psychology of it and being your own worst enemy, like I can see now being older and, and the perspective, um, away from those ideas or away from those situations of, of what the issues were. But I think it was having uh, that lived out in front of me of like, no, you can do something. You have to put in the work. It's going to be hard. It's never going to be easy, but you just have to show up and make it happen. Yeah, I love that. And uh, clearly you have that first an example, but I want to start to tap into your wisdom right here and now early in the conversation. <laughs> so a question for you then, you know, for anybody who's listening, who is, struggling with that aspect of things, whether it's the discipline, whether it's the self-belief, whether it's the uh, imposter syndrome, you know, early on in those stages from your firsthand experiences you just described and or, you know, later experiences in life at this point, what would you tell them? Um, how would you help them overcome some of those limiting beliefs, some of those psychological factors that are really the downfall of, I don't know, 95, 97% of entrepreneurs? Yeah. It's interesting because this is basically the advice I give my kids. Um, I, th you don't need permission from anyone to do anything. Like if you want to learn a skill, get up in the morning like I did. Now there's so many more resources available to you than, than even what I had. I did, I did it with printed books. Like I, I, I'm not the youngest guy in the entire world, right? So now we've got YouTube. We've got, you know, tons and tons of lives. We've got chat GTP, like what, whatever. Get up. And, and learn the skill. And, and the fact of the matter is, is, is there is a lot of uh, benefit to formal education in a lot of different formats. But the fact is, if you really want to learn something, if you really want to achieve something, you have to take uh, the responsibility on yourself in order to make it happen. You could have the best teacher in the world. It doesn't matter if you don't apply it. It doesn't matter if you don't practice it. So just realize like no one is, you don't need permission from anyone to achieve what you want to achieve. And it sounds like a platitude and it sounds kind of corny and cheesy, but it's true because you just have to do the work and you have to stick with it. Yeah. I, it, I mean, at this point, you're just talking my language. Sounds like you've, uh, <laughs> you've done some research on me or something, but uh, you know, formal education is great in a lot of different avenues and necessary for many different career paths. But self-education is just on a whole different level. Self-education yeah. is just something else. Um, first of all, self-education weeds out individuals just by default because it requires the type of person that has that drive to go and seek out that education just like yourself, just like myself, and uh, want to go acquire those skills. And that's amazing advice you're giving your kids as well. Uh, but you know, formal education, it, it's a constructed path already. You're just going to follow that path the steps are very clear, but you know, self-education is just, I feel like a completely different level of education. And whether you're formally educated or not, I would highly recommend the self-education path above and beyond. And I think it's a lifelong journey. I think you continue to learn and continue to evolve. I think you would agree with that as well. That's just what I was going to key in on. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 48 years old. I still learn new stuff every day. Every day I wake up in the morning and I realize there's a new mountain of information that I need to learn. You know, I, I wouldn't say necessarily I mastered the, the realm of web development or technology, but I got to a point to where I could build courses, uh, I could teach people, I could, you know, get published in magazines or whatever. So I, I got to a point to where I went from a deep seated understanding and belief that I would never learn these things to being put in an opportunity to where I, I've been able to legitimately say affect the lives of hundreds of thousands of people through the content that I've built over the years. And, and that was like one swim lane. And so now I've picked another swim lane. So how am I going to put on now this entrepreneurial hat? How am I going to learn all the different disciplines that come with building a business from scratch and, and run in that swim lane? I've got no formal education in any of that. 
<laughs> so right. it, it's, it's a continual lifelong process. It, it really is just a, a, a mindset system that you have to adopt in order to continue to learn and grow and achieve. Yeah, I love that. And uh, I also want to ask you about something else you were really early on. So you were in the tech space, but you were also very early on the podcast scene and you've been involved in multiple podcasts, host of a couple different podcasts. I remember the first time we met, you were telling me about you know the, the trajectory of the different podcasts you had. Uh, I right. think I saw recently, it might have been in your bio or on your Twitter account somewhere that you're hosting a podcast with a couple of other uh, friends or colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're involved in many different ways in the podcasting landscape. And again, you were early to the scene, uh, <laughs> all things considered. So I want you yeah. to talk about that. How did you figure out this is the path to go? How are you so early to the podcast scene? Maybe what are some of the keys to being early to something that's going to be big uh, later on, if you could maybe fine tune some of those um, and just talk about that experience in general with the podcasting scene. Sure. Yeah. So uh, for Christmas, my this before uh, everybody in the world had an iPod and even before iPhone. <laughs> so my wife got me this cheap MP3 player for Christmas and we were working on an addition to my house. And so I'm trying to figure out how to load music onto this thing. And really, I, I wanted to figure out how to get like audiobooks or something like that on, on this little device. Somehow, I ran into uh, a, a radio broadcast of Leo Laporte. This was probably back in late or, or early 2005, uh, where he's talking to a 13 year old kid on the radio about this thing called podcasting, right? And, the, you know, well, everybody knows what it is now. Back then, I had to explain to people what in the world podcasting was. And so I, I, I remember thinking, and again, it's kind of a similar vein to the, okay, I'm just going to get up and, and, and make the work happen. I just remember thinking, I could do this. Like, I might not be great at it. It, it might be really hard, but I could do this. And it would give me an opportunity to, to kind of get my name out there and, and sort of make an impact. Um, so I just, I, I had to write software by scratch. I had to figure out how to record things and, and, and put out my first show uh, that was just recorded on a cheap plastic MP3 player. Um, and I think there was a trash truck involved in the recording because I was in my car at a park and it came and, and you know, emptied the, the trash can in the middle of that thing. Um, and so then, then it, it grew and evolved. And um, at some point I, I stopped podcasting for a little bit because I put more of my attention towards building courses. And that was my, my money-making endeavor where the podcasting was more brand building and, and uh, you know, kind of a lead magnet type of a situation. But I remember being really early in the space. Everybody was trying to figure out what it was, uh, what it was going to mean to the market. I even had an opportunity to where the consulting company that I was working with, we got into a, a room with some executives at Warner Brothers. Um, and we were talking about building a podcast for them and, and trying to build a show around movies that they were going to be releasing. <laughs> they wow. didn't get it. What year is this, by the way? This was probably 2006. Wow. Okay. Maybe seven. That's maybe really seven, somewhere around there. Right. Yeah. That's really early. Yeah. They didn't get it. They were just like, I don't understand. Like, it, they're like, I remember them asking me, what, what is a, a big show? Like, what's the audience? What's the reach of what you would consider a big show? And I was like, well, you know, if you have a, a podcast audience in the hundreds of thousands, and again, this is still really early on, I, that's big. And he's just like, we cancel shows you know, television shows that are in the millions of, of viewers. Like, I don't get it. And so it was just a, such an interesting time and space to be in, to have to, um, for, for creators and for consumers to try and figure out what, what does this technology mean and what kind of impact is it going to have? Um, yeah. and so I I'd wish I could say if they did get it at that point. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. That makes Especially sense. Especially major okay. media. Yeah. Yeah. They're still catching on. <laughs> they kind of are right. Yeah. But okay. I, I wish I could say, you know, I was so early in the space. Like I, I saw where it was going to go. I capitalized on a bunch of stuff, you know, and I just like most people trying to figure out as, as we went along. But as I come back to running a show all on my own and now the amount of technology that's available, the tools that are available, the, the process and techniques that are available make it so much easier to build, produce and maintain a show. And so for that, I'm, I'm super excited. Yeah, for sure. And I love that because I didn't even know parts of that story, uh, especially being in that boardroom and hearing that feedback. <laughs> Again, I'm not surprised at all. 
Right. Uh, and, you know, to their credit, it makes sense. If you're an executive and in charge of all these major decisions, at that point in time, it was not clear at all this is going to be a major avenue. So, you know, to invest in that and to just take someone's word for it is not really exactly. the, the smart play. Uh, but, you know, that is the pros and cons of big versus small businesses. I tell a lot of my clients, if you're a small business or a beginner entrepreneur, the advantage you have is speed, maneuverability. You can adaptability. You can try things and you know, if they don't work out, or if you don't enjoy them, you can pivot tomorrow. But Amazon is not going to start a whole new project and then pivot the next day, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, pros and cons of both sides. But I guess, you know, maybe that is the message, right? Maybe the message is you didn't know it's going to be this big thing. You didn't know this may be, a, you know, a huge pillar of what you end up doing long term. But you saw an opportunity early on and you decided to just explore. So maybe the real message is in the courage to pursue that opportunity early on. I think so. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's now it's to understand what the medium is and what it can be. And, and so when I look at podcasting and, and when I look at running a show, it's, it's less about, okay, how am I going to build this audience big enough to where I can get brand deals and I can make it to the top charts and like, sure, that would be fun. And I would really enjoy doing that. But there are so many different podcasts and, and the medium is very different. I, I think that it's important that as you uh, create content and you publish content, you understand like what the purpose and what the impact is of running a blog or of running a YouTube channel or running a podcast or being on social media. Like all of these things have a lot in common, but the strategy and the expected outcome of each one of them is, is wildly different. And so what I see podcast being is an opportunity to, to expand my network and to expand my brand in such a way that I get an opportunity. Like if I, if I didn't run my podcast, you and I never would have met. Yeah. And, and so here I am talking to you and, and learning about sales, learning about building brands, learning so much from you and people like you. And none of that would be available to me if I hadn't ever started a podcast. And mm -hmm. so the networking capabilities and the ability to, to give a voice to what I'm doing is huge opportunities are, are born out of those relationships that make it all worth it in the end. Yeah, I, I love that. I think it just reminds me of asymmetric risk reward relationships, right? Now we hear about the best investors in the world, the Buffets and Mungers and all these guys, Ray Dalio's, they look for these very low risk, high reward investments. Right. Whereas, you know, if you ask the average person, high risk, they'll say high reward. That's just a saying <laughs> that's been ingrained in all of us, right? High risk, right. high reward. You know, bet it all on the house or whatever it is, right? I don't gamble, so I don't know what the terminology <laughs> would be. Uh, but, you know, the reality is people who do well actually take bets that are lower risk, high reward, and uh, they want that asymmetric risk reward relationship. And I see podcasting and what you just explained in the exact same way. I feel like you basically just said that because you look at a podcast and uh, as a medium of you know, putting out content, putting out information, getting yourself out there, your message out there building a community, helping others, whatever way you want to approach it, you can do a podcast and you can have, you know, the connections that are being built, like, you know, myself and yourself meeting and actually, you know, building this friendship over time. Now, uh, you can have, you know, the information staying online for long periods of time for people to revisit and that just, you know, appreciating and value over time. Um, you can have so many different things. You can have the brand deals and getting paid on the back. And so there are multiple ways to capitalize on this one medium. Whereas, you know, the same work, the same effort in a different direction may not have the same uh, rewards. So I think looking at it, uh, you saw this again earlier, but I think uh, it, it makes sense. And that's how you're looking at it, which brings us to a different topic, which is creating courses and creating your uh, knowledge and information and everything and packaging that and, and putting that out there for people to take advantage of. And it's one of those other risk or relationships where, mm. you know, the risk is very low. The overhead and the capital needed is very low. Uh, if you have the expertise, the knowledge, uh, everything that you can put into that, um, you're already, you know, well off. And then the rewards can be exponential. It can pay off for life. It can pay dividends for a very long time. It's one of those opportunities, again, that I think is very beneficial. Uh, I have my own platform where I have all of my sales trainings, business trainings and everything hosted as well. Uh, all of our clients get access to that. So I'm very much a believer in this. But I want to hear about how you got into the course creation space uh, and then we'll get into some tactical advice for everybody watching as well. But how did you get into that space and um, what exactly do you do in that space today? Cool. Yeah. So I, I, I've been building technology courses. I have been for the last 15 years. Um, and the, 
the early ones were bad. I mean, they're just really bad, you know? <laughs> and anytime you learn a new skill or, or you try to develop a new muscle, like you have to give yourself that opportunity to do really sucky work in the beginning because that, that's, that's the path to doing things well. Um, and so it just, it, it came from me being in a space to where I was a pretty good writer, you know, I was being published. And then I had an opportunity to start building these courses. Then one day, um, there was a, a, a career day at my kid's school and it was, you know, come in and teach, you know, tell everybody about what your profession is. And so my daughter asked me to come in and of course I, I'm like excited and delighted to do it, but I started to panic a little bit. I'm like, how do I teach a room full of 10 year olds about computer programming in a way that's going to make sense to them? Right. Um, and so we'd recently had a, a birthday at the house and I looked up and I saw, you, you know, uh, the happy birthday signs where it's like, uh, each letter is strung together and, you know, mm -hmm. you can put it up on the wall. I was like, well, this, this is a perfect representation of what a string in, is in computer programming. A string is a series of characters strung together. That's all it is. Wow. So I was like, okay, well, if I got a piece of kite string, if I got this happy birthday sign, and I got a couple other things that was me very familiar to, to the kids in these class and use these props and use these metaphors as a way to try and convey a little bit of what computer programming was, maybe this would work. So I went into the class, started, you know, teaching them a little bit. I had two kids come up. They each held the side of the thing and they got it. I could see it in their eyes. I could see it in their faces. They understood what these concepts meant. And I was just like, well, if this worked for kids, it probably would work for adults. So I went home and I retooled my, the, the next course that I was going to work on. And I completely changed how I presented this material that I remember having a very strong emotion attached to that I was never going to get it. I was never going to learn it because I, I, I just didn't have any formal education. So I, I retooled all my lessons to figure out a way to package my ideas in, in a way that's easily transferable from me as a quote unquote expert to a student. And those courses just started to take off. That's when I was getting people you know, twit, uh, sending me a Twitter message, emailing me, putting on the, on, on the course discussions. Like I, this is so much more clear. I can understand these things. Now I have no experience in software development and now I'm building websites. And mm -hmm. so it, it had such a huge impact on me of being able to figure out, okay, yes, you can achieve something. You can do something in your own life. And oftentimes when you, when you've reached that level, then people say, well, can you teach me? Can you show me? Or maybe you want to build a course, you want to do it, but it's not until after you demonstrate to yourself and someone else that you can replicate that success in someone else that you are really in a position to where you can have a successful course. And so, like I said, when I repositioned on Twitter and figured out like, well, what's my, my next step, that was one of the things that I wanted to help people learn how to do say, okay, yeah, you're an expert. But how can we figure out a way to make it so that we take what you do and make it a reality for someone else as well? Got it. I have so many questions for you as a, as a follow up on this that uh, we can go so many different directions. I just love this topic and I can tell, you know, you're passionate about it as well. And I love that you got so creative with your uh, with your presentation to the kids. It just goes to show how analytical you are. I can just tell the way you think and the way you connect the <laughs> dots, uh, which makes sense. You know, the, the path you took definitely makes sense now looking at the full story. But uh, when it comes to course creation, first of all, at what level do you even know you're an expert? I mean, I feel like I have my thoughts on this, but I want to hear from you, somebody who's, uh, who's an expert actually in this space. Um, you know, how does somebody know I'm an expert on this topic and I want to create courses around this and I want to turn this into a business? Uh I throw around that word expert and, you know, I, I did the, the quotes when I said that, you know, because right. Who really is an expert on, on, on anything? And of course that we have, you know, authorities and spaces or, or whatever, but the fact of the matter is, is like any course that you go out on the web and find, um, they are an expert in their story. They are an expert in, in this perhaps specific mechanics or approaches or, or what they're doing. And they have a method and they have a, a way of teaching you how to do something where, like I said, hopefully they can replicate in you the success that they've had in them. 
But to think like, well, I, I need to be a world renowned expert. I need to be an industry expert in order to do that, uh, in order to create a course, you know, is silly because it, you could pick any, any prominent person in any industry that you want. There is someone who knows more about, you know, certain aspects of what they're good at than that one person does. So it's, it's an understanding and it's an acceptance really to say that I don't need to be the, you know, the foremost authority on, on anything in order to teach people. What I need to be able to do is to tell a story and affect a transformation in someone else that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And if I can do that, then I'm in a position to where I can build a course. Yeah, I like that definition. And I think um, it's a very practical definition and a practical way to look at it. I have two thoughts on this and I want to hear your feedback on this as well. From one perspective, I look at it as you know a definition I heard, I think it was from Tim Ferriss years ago, where he said, you're an expert if you're only one level above the person you're teaching. So right. technically, you don't really have to know much if the person you're dealing with is a novice. To them, you're an expert. That's one way to look at it. Um, another way that I look at it is to be an expert on any field. I think you have to have one tangible experience in what you're talking about and what you're teaching. And uh, number two, results in what you're talking about and what you're teaching. So for myself, for example, sales is the area where I feel I'm definitely one of the uh, foremost experts on. And the way I look at that is, you know, I know guys who are pretty well established, pretty well known in the online space, who have never worked a sales job in their lives. They've read a couple of books, started one or two online businesses, and now they're a sales expert, right? Um, when I compare myself, I've actually worked in more than seven industries, directly worked in sales as a sales rep, as a sales manager, director of sales, regional director, VP of sales. I've held every position. I've trained salespeople, hired salespeople. So if I talk about selling cars, I've sold cars. If I talk about selling, you know, in the fitness industry, I've done that. Door-to-door -door sales, I've done that. I've done all of this. I have real tangible experience. So I feel comfortable. I can speak on it. And then the other part is the results. You know, I have exact numbers. I have client results, testimonials. I have spreadsheets with what I've generated for different businesses that I can show at any given moment. So you could say I have the receipts, right? Yep. So I think you have to have those results as well. Um, another way that I guess would be an extension of this is if you're in a room full of other experts, um, you can hold your own. I, I would look at it this way. At that point, personally, I would feel comfortable to go and create a course and scale it and put myself out there. Um, but I feel like if I'm going by the definition of you only need to be one level above the person you're teaching to be considered an expert, I wouldn't feel too confident uh, yeah. about selling what I'm selling. And that's rule number one of sales. You got to be sold on it yourself. So <laughs> I wouldn't feel good doing that, right? So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that between those two metrics of uh, expertise? So I, I get where where Tim's uh, comment is going, right? It, it's, it's trying to hit at that emotional level to say what I basically just said of, you know, you don't have to be a an actual expert in order to teach people. But I think it's a little misleading, like you're saying, because really, if, if you're only one step ahead, you're missing a lot of context, you're missing a lot of nuance, you're missing a lot of experience. And so I like to think of it as this. You, first you go one, then you go one to one, and then you go one to many, right? So first you have to do it yourself. You have to have the experiences, you have to be able to uh, look back and demonstrate success and 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 failure so much that you can learn through failure. But you have to have done the work yourself. Then you go to someone and you say, okay, well, I'm going to work with you on a on a one on one basis in order to, to to take what I've learned and transfer it to you and, and and see if we can replicate that success in that person. And then you have results and you have successes and you have failures to draw upon. And once you do that not just with one person, but maybe with two, three, four, or five people, then you take those experiences and then you broaden it out and say, okay, now I'm at, in, a, in a position to where I can do it with a group of people. This is a progression that I like to take the, the clients that I work with through to be able to say whether or not you're ready to build a course. It sounds like a lot of work and it sounds time consuming and it kind of is, but it also doesn't have to be. But the fact of the matter is, is if you want to come to market, with something that has your name on it and you want to spend all the time and the effort and, and the blood, sweat, and the tears it's going to take in order to do a product launch and you just throw something up that you, you know, put together in a weekend in PowerPoint, 
Like you're doing the market a disservice, you're doing yourself a disservice. So there's so much really that you need to go through in order to validate whether or not you have what it takes and whether or not your ideas are valuable to the market in order to get yourself in a position to where you're ready to put a course out. I 100% agree. That's very well said. First you go one, then you go one to one, then you go one to many. I, I love that. That's the best <laughs> way that I've heard it put. So thank you for sharing that yeah. uh, piece of wisdom. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. My own experience is the exact same way. And that builds on what I was just saying in terms of having tangible experience yourself. Uh, and then one-to-one, -one, you're helping others, you're pulling others up and you're proving out the concept. And for me, for example, that was running sales meetings when I became a sales manager. Right. That was my first evolution. And now I told myself, I remember so vividly thinking about this and I know I have questions for you, but I can't help but share some of these stories. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't, I remember this so vividly when I became a sales manager, the first morning meeting I had to run for the sales team, I had to have a talk with myself because up to that point I was very selfish. You know, every, you know, company that I worked with or every opportunity I was involved in, it was about myself and me being the top producer and my goals and nobody else mattered. And then it came to this point where I was like, I'm about to run a sales meeting. And uh, I have to teach some closing tactics, some sales tactics, what works well for me. And that means I'm going to have to share my secrets. That means I'm going to have to you know, <laughs> duplicate myself. So it completely changed. My whole paradigm right. uh, shifted. And that went from you know one to one. Now I was working with a couple of sales managers, then one to many. Now I'm training the whole office and then scaled out from there and outsourced teams and then eventually doing what I do today. So I love that. I think that's very well put. Um, in terms of taking your course to market and... Um, you know, everybody wants that end result, right? Every just getting sales, getting revenue coming in, getting money coming in. That's what everybody dreams about. I, I hear a lot of people day to day coming across myself or my team saying, you know, uh, we want to build a course. We want to be in the online space. We want to travel and make money. All these, you know, amazing ideas. And that's all good and well. But I want you to paint the picture for us of what it actually looks like, practically speaking, from saying, okay, I understand I'm an expert in this space. I understand that you know, I have the, the raw materials to put together, you know, the course curriculum and the direction that I want to go and what I want to teach. And how do I go from this stage to making money? And now, you know, I'm a, I'm a name in the online space or a household name. What, what's in between? What are, if you could put it into some practical steps? I think if I could boil it down to one single principle, it all comes down to idea validation. Because you can think that you have a great idea for a course, and you probably do. But the way that it's going to look, the way that you'll position it in the market, the way that you'll create the outline, the way that you'll record the modules, the way you'll do the landing page, like there's so many different variables to building a course that you have to recognize and you have to understand that your, your first intuitive thought is probably wrong. And so every step of the way, what you need to be able to do is, is, is get feedback from either a small group of people that, you know, you have a relationship with or people within your, your, your public audience on social media or email list or whatever, and be able to get feedback from people for every single step of the way, um, in order to validate that what your assumptions are or the direction that you want to go is, is the right place. And I've seen this with people who even have existing courses and they want to do a new launch or they want to do something different. And they start to believe like, ah, I've, I've sold before, you know, I've, I, I have this audience, like I can kind of not relax or rest on my laurels or whatever, but just kind of like, I've got this dialed in. I know exactly what to do. But if you don't take those steps to question yourself every single step of the way to figure out what's valuable to the people who would be taking this course. Uh, I think that's where you get into a situation where you put in tons of work and now you can't go and relax by the pool because things aren't working the way that you want them to. And so right. if, there, if there was just any one idea, it would be validate your ideas every single step of the way. I like that answer because it's focused on the more strategic approach as opposed to all the tactical steps because there's a million tactical steps yeah. down to the details of the domain names and all the techie stuff, right, right. you know, whatever <laughs> it is, right? All these tactical steps that over confuse people. But I like that you're focused on the, the strategic approach and just the simplicity of it. And personally for me, I would not go seek specialized advice 
from the average person or my friends or even my social media audience. I think some ideas and some interest, you could gauge your social media audience or community. That's good. Uh, but generally speaking, I think this is where the value of somebody like yourself comes in, where you have an expert who is actually guiding you throughout the way. I've had mentors all along my sales and business career. Uh, from day one, when I was 15, 16 years old yeah. to today, I've always had mentors. I remember when I was first creating my uh, platform with all my sales training and courses and whatnot, I had a mentor as well, uh, who I paid a pretty large sum for. And uh, he was helping me on the business side in general. Uh, he's a well-established name in the online space. So he was helping me with a lot of that, but the course creation was a part of it. Mm. Uh, and he gave me a lot of that feedback. And I remember one of the first uh, pieces of advice that he gave me it was the first thing I ever recorded on camera. So naturally I was terrible <laughs> and it was super awkward. And uh, I showed him and I'm kind of nervous. I'm waiting for his feedback. And he looks at me, he watches it for like three seconds. And he's like, you know what this reminds me of? I'm like, what? I'm intrigued. I'm thinking it's real feedback. And he says, uh, what do you say? He said a hostage, uh, what do you say? A hostage uh, <laughs> negotiation video or something along those lines. <laughs> And, you have the uh, paper up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm being forced to speak uh, unnatural smile. And then when I looked at the video, as he said that I realized he's right. And I was like, mm. Oh, man, there's a lot of work to be done here. So yeah, you do need somebody to tell you that, you know, and yeah. your friend, your mom, your uncle might not tell you that they might say, Oh, yeah, it looks great. You know, and you know, whether they love you, or they just don't know better. So yeah. I think you got to seek expert advice. This is where mentorship comes in. And yeah, if I had somebody like you who's so well versed in this specific topic, when I was building out the course, it would have made my life 10 times easier. Hmm. And those type of investments, from my point of view, are always well worth it. So I would highly recommend anybody who's in the process of building out a course to seek you out um, and uh, ask you those questions because I think it'll just save them so much time, money, energy, and everything else. Um, but moving on from that, I want to ask you where you see the biggest mistakes that people make in their course creation process or just this process in general, whether it's from the very beginning of doubting that they're even an expert mm -hmm. or it's the practical steps and getting paralysis by analysis because there's a million things to do and they're not sure what, you know, what direction to take uh, and they never do anything for the long term and then it just dies out. Or if it's, you know, the course is built, but they have no idea how to market it, how to generate sales and revenue. Where do you usually see the big mistakes? At the, uh, risk of repeating myself, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to like double down on idea validation. Okay. Because I, I've worked with people who have existing courses. Um, I had this one gentleman, he, he launched the course. He's got a really big following, uh, hundreds of thousands of people across different social media platforms and his course isn't selling. And so I went to his, his landing page and I was just like, well, there's no transformation here. Like there's, there's no you're, you're basically telling people some boring stuff that's important, would be very important in their life if they did it, but you're not selling the dream. You're not selling the transformation for what they're doing. And I asked him like, so, um, who, who did you show this to? He's like, well, you know, my wife reviewed it and it looked really good. And I was like, okay, cool. So here's a, a framework that, that I like to take people through in order to, to, to validate ideas for, for your courses. Right. So you have mm -hmm. your, your, your posse, your pioneers, and then you do a pre-sell. Okay. So you build up a posse and, and it, it's cool of what, what you mentioned. And, and I kind of see this as a mix of a couple different types of people that you want to talk to. It's a small group of people that you have personal relationship with that you can bounce ideas off of. So you have an existing customer. If you can get one, you have a potential customer, you have a contemporary. So you have another creator that's maybe in your space or, or your friends with it's doing a, a similar types of things. You have a mentor or a coach, and then you have yourself. So now you're like, okay, well, I have this uh, outline that I want to do for my course. Send it to these people and get some immediate feedback. And then you can quickly see, okay, well, I'm getting off topic here. You're like, this doesn't really make sense. This isn't, this isn't keeping my promise of, of what the course is supposed to be. You can get that stuff back pretty quickly. And so yeah. once you get that feedback, then you can take it to what I call the pioneers. And that's where you get three to five strangers, people you don't know who would be interested in your course, who want that transformation. And you work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Here's my outline. You know, here's my slides. Here's what I want to present. And then you use this process in order to get feedback. And this is, this is validating the fact that not only is there uh, demand for what you have, but then one of the main questions, one of the key questions that you ask them 
during this interaction is if I created a course that solved these problems that you have, would you pay for it? And how much would you pay? Okay. Because until money exchanges hands, there's, there's no real validation of your ideas. So then you move into pre-selling your course. You announce what the course is going to be. You put it out there. You try to get 10, 20, you know, a small group of people in order to, to, to take your course. You offer it at a super big discount compared to what you're going to offer the course when it's fully prepared. And it's supposed to be really low production value, really low fidelity. You show up with an outline, maybe you show up with some slides, but you do it live and you have that one-on-one -on -one or a group, you know, one-to-many interaction with people in order to not be able to demonstrate that you can affect the change in their life. But what you're looking at this process as is a way to ask as many questions as possible. So when I explained X, Y, and Z, if I had said it this way, do you think that would have made more sense? And so you get to kind of fine tune and, and essentially do market research with these people. Um, but they're paying for it. And so that now gives you resources to go and apply to your full course. If you go through this process, you're going to find those mistakes. You're going to encounter those stumbling blocks. And when you get to the point where you're ready to hit record on your actual course, so many of those blind spots will be revealed. And you can continue to use the same process over and over again as you refine your course. Yeah, I love that you have a whole system built out, which makes sense because obviously this is what you're an expert in. But I love that you have a whole system built out in terms of validating the idea. So it just goes to show me right now how important that step actually is. And I think uh, it was really good. You doubled down and that was the same answer because <laughs> as you expanded on that, I think it made a lot of sense. And uh, for everybody listening, that's a very helpful practical step by step by step by step you basically outline exactly how to scale it up right so everybody can go put that on repeat and listen to that <laughs> section over and over again uh but that's amazing I'm, I'm in full agreement with that process and how you did that um i think that is the right way to go and you have so much feedback that you almost can't go wrong and uh you know somebody like myself who does have a big ego and i try to keep <laughs> it in check and remain humble as much as i can but i used to always think you know entrepreneurs talk about I thought this was a great idea. I took it to market, then it was terrible. You know, and I used to think maybe you, you're just not smart enough. You know, if I have a great idea, I'm sure others will love it. Then I actually got into business for myself <laughs> and I saw this exact same thing. So much of what interested me, you know, from a small, you know, caption or a, you know, a piece of copy or, you know, a picture or a quote or something to an actual course, to an actual project idea, whatever it might be, that really intrigued me. And I realized there was zero demand or, uh, zero attractiveness to my audience or to my clients. And that's when I realized, you know, people are just different and what you see as valuable, others may not see as valuable. It's very hard to be objective when you're in your own shoes as much as you can try. Yeah. And I think somebody like you or me, we try all the time to be very objective. Um, I'm just speaking for you, but I assume we're pretty much similar. Well, you always in that, try, right? You're right? Yeah, just from you what know, I'm hearing, right? Even an attempt at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we definitely put in the effort to be objective as much as possible and you know, look back at ourselves, at our ideas, at what we're doing, at our work, and try to look at it from an objective perspective. But it's still hard you know, because yeah. you're still not somebody else with their life experiences looking at this thing from the outside. So I think it's it's really good you built in such a bulletproof system of validating the idea. I think that's really important. I want to ask you this question because this came to mind as you were talking, and it's something that I've always loved and believed in, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts because I could see you going either way on this. There's a classic saying, I don't know whose quote this is. All these quotes are arbitrary anyways. Everybody said it a million times, but uh, it's essentially people don't pay for what you do. They pay for who you are. Mm. So in the context of course creation, what do you think of that? People don't pay for what you do or what you say in the course. They pay for who you are. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's a, a different way to to slice that is is basically, you know, people don't pay for information, they pay for implementation, which is a, a similar uh, part to that. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is if you want to learn how to build a course, if you want to learn how to be a salesperson, if you want to learn how to be a copywriter, if you want to be a software developer, it doesn't matter. Like you can find a ridiculous amount of information available for free on the internet that will keep you busy for months on end. Like it's the information life. There's yeah. no shortage of information out there. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's not about whether or not 
if you're going to build a course, if you're going to coach someone, if, if you're going to be in these spaces of, of whether you're going to have some unrevealed piece of wisdom that's never been expressed before, it's none of that. So when it comes to, to building a course, it's having an organized and systemized prepackaged way of being able to, again, allow that transformation to happen for someone else in, in a guided path. Because one of the other things I, I, I talk a lot about is finding your core message versus bonus material, right? And so there's all kinds of things that I could teach you about course creation, but there's a critical path to that. There's just the stuff that you need to know. And then there's all kinds of things that you could know after that. And so I think some of that does play into the personality, the personal brand, the expression of the course creator. And, and a lot of that plays into it because my approach and the way that I do things isn't going to resonate with everybody. And, you know, one of my friends uh, who's doing the same thing, they might get more success with them. So I, I certainly think that that plays a lot into it. But at the end of the day, it's not about information. The information is everywhere. It's how good of a job can someone do in order to help you take those steps and achieve success on your own. Yeah, and it's interesting you took that perspective of the implementation side of it. So it's not just the information, it's how you implement it. The way that I looked at it was, uh, the way that I looked at that quote or that saying was, you know, they're not necessarily paying for the information. So that first piece is the same. The second part is where I looked at it a bit differently. They pay for who you are, meaning they pay for your credibility. Hmm. They pay for your authority. They pay yeah. for the fact that, you know, you're somebody I want to learn from. If somebody comes up to me on the street and says, let me teach you how to make a billion dollars. First thing I'm going to ask him is what? Are you a billionaire? Right. right. Because if you're not a billionaire, you can't teach me how to make a billion dollars. I don't want to hear it. But if he says I'm a billionaire, I'm all ears. Right. I'll cancel my day. Let's go get a coffee. Teach me. Right. So that's the way I looked at it is people pay for who you are. I feel like a lot of times when you're positioned correctly, when you have the authority, the credibility, I guess this goes back to my previous point of having the tangible experience and the results then people pay for that. Because the reason, by the way, this all came to my mind, just as we're talking here, is uh, you mentioned you have somebody who, you know, as a client who has a pretty big presence, but their course isn't selling, right? And we were talking about all the tactical aspects of why it's not selling. Immediately, what I thought was when I first launched my course, it did really well in the first month, but it wasn't because the course was great. The course was terrible and the platform <laughs> was terrible and it was so clunky and it was so ugly. And, you know, looking back at it, I can't even imagine I launched something like that, right? Um, but it was me who was selling it and it was me who was the person teaching and it was me coming with this vast conviction of what I've done and what I can teach you in sales. And I feel like that is, it could have been, you know, a piece of paper. It could have been an online course. It could have been anything. I could have sold it. Right. Because it was real. The substance was there. Right. So that's what I feel like, you know, when you talk about people pay for who you are, that's the way that I see it. Um, right. so that's why I brought that up as we were just riffing back and forth. I was comparing my first month when I launched and I was like, you know, it did well, despite all the ugliness and terrible all stuff. The warts, yeah. So no, yeah, I, agree so I with guess that's that perspective for yeah. the audience. Yeah. And, and, and I think that your established brands and your ability to, to show results is huge, you know, and sometimes we can succeed in spite of, you know, some, some missteps or, or, or whatever within our course, because like you're saying, it is coming from a source of a person who's demonstrated through irrefutable fact and data that you've been able to achieve, you know, a thing. And mm -hmm. that's gold. Right. No, I agree. Yeah. It was just interesting. I wanted to touch on that point. So as we go into uh, the wrap up of our conversation here, I don't want to take too much of your time. I would love to keep talking. I could probably talk to you for this another couple hours. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I have so many other questions that I didn't even ask, but I think we're going to have to do a multi-part series here. I'll definitely love to have you back on. Anytime. Uh, I want to ask it. you about, um, yeah, for sure. I want to ask you about going into the future and how you see yourself over the next year, three years, however you look at this. Uh, and you mentioned a couple things to me off air before we started, but how do you see yourself going into the future? How do you see the landscape of social media in general evolving? How do you see marketing, sales, course creation, business evolving? You know, what do you see at? I'm just curious to know your perspective in general. There's no right or wrong. There's no, yeah. I'm not looking for anything specific. I just want to know if I'm in your head, how am I looking at the next, let's say 12 months or so, and how am I positioning myself? Right. So I, I see the opportunity for long form content and, and basically 
more evergreen kind of coming back to what I said at the beginning and uh, uh, content that, that lives around longer being more and more valuable. Social media content is great. Um, I've learned a lot about how to express myself uh, through writing social media content. I've gained a, a following in a completely different area of business in the world that I, I never would have through social media. And so I, I see a lot of value in continuing to you know go that route. But I'm also seeing as I think what I want to do is start putting YouTube content first and then allowing my social media content to come from that in order to be able to create something that is a production and is uh, has, has a lot of, of impact and a lot of uh, information, you know, useful information that's available uh, that can stick around longer than a really sweet Twitter thread, <laughs> you know, that gets some attention and then essentially goes away. And so, yeah, what, what I'm, the strategy I'm thinking of is, okay, I want to come up with 50 different lead magnets, 50 different um, uh, topics for courses, mix and match both of those, and then start creating YouTube content um, with intention rather than just turning on the camera and start talking and hoping I come up with something good, you know, using that same process of idea validation in order to figure out, okay, well, what's going to be the best title for this? What kind of thumbnail do I want for this? Uh, and and kind of go that route. So that's kind of what I'm thinking of the direction I'd like to head with in the next year. Yeah, I love that. I, it's the idea of doing work that's going to stay long term and that's going to compound for you and work for you while you sleep. And all the great things that we love again about investments is that asymmetric risk reward relationship, which is why I wanted to launch the podcast as well and go more in the direction of longer form content. So I think I'm with you there. Um, so last question that I just want to ask you, and this is something that I think I'll be asking everybody who knows as this evolves and as I change my mind, you know, but for the time being, sure. this is something just so you know, the backstory, I don't think I'm going to tell this every single time. So moving forward, I'll probably just have to ask the question, but just for the sake of this, I want you to know the backstory. When I was younger, you know, 16, 17 at the time, going to a lot of business conferences up to about maybe 20, 23 was probably my last business conference. And I decided, you know, I want to pivot and go a different direction. That's a whole different conversation. But uh, I was going to a lot of business conferences and I had a question at that time, depending on what age I was. So whether I was 17, I was 19, I was 20, I would go up to these speakers. I would always try to sit VIP. So I was in the, in the rooms with the right people and I would go up to them, approach them. And I would just say, you know, Hey, don't want to take much of your time, but you know, this is currently what I'm doing. This is how old I am. Knowing everything you know today, if you could go back to your blank self, so 19 year old <laughs> self, 20 year old self, what's the one piece of advice you'd give yourself? And I heard all kinds of interesting, you know, advice. I remember this very well-known marketing guy who I was expecting some, you know, really good advice. But I'll tell you off air who it was. And he says, don't do drugs. And I was like, that's the advice. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I did a lot of drugs when I was younger. I was like, okay, fair enough. You know, and then I had other guys give me elaborate business strategies. And, you know, it was really interesting, the different types of advice that I got. And it just, again, it spoke to that person's psychology and what I needed to take away from them. And I just added all those to, to layers of my character, to, to myself growing. And that's how I looked at it. So I'm going to ask you the same thing. Knowing everything you know today, if you could go back to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give yourself? I find this question fascinating because I have, I have young adults and, and teens as, as kids. And uh, so I give this advice. And it's interesting because oftentimes when you're in that stage of life, you don't necessarily <laughs> avail yourself of the advice. But I want to go back to what I said before, because I, I think this is, this is the key. You don't need permission from anyone. You just don't. Figure out what you want to do. Stumble, fall, fail, mess up. You're going to do all of that stuff. But every single time you do that, you're going to be learning. You want to be directionally correct in the effort that you take. And the only way that you're going to do that is to start. So you don't need anyone to tell you it's the right time or it's the right idea. You just start and you will figure it out as you go. That's great advice. I love that. I'm ready to run through a wall. And uh, <laughs> I love that it's coming from a real place for you because you have kids, right? And yeah. you know, I don't have that experience yet. So I can't imagine what that feels like. I can only you know try to put myself in your shoes, but you are in this position of you're trying to give your essentially younger self, right. uh, you know, better advice. So they don't make the same mistakes as you do. And I can imagine, you know, how frustrating it would be if they don't listen, but, uh, that's great advice. We all get to I make our own mistakes. You... So yeah. 
Exactly, right? And yeah. I'm sure they'll learn their own way. And uh, hopefully the goal would be that they surpass you yes. and, uh, you know, do better things and bigger things than you do. And that's that's how it should be. We lay the, the foundation for those to come after us, whether it's our kids or everybody else who's consuming this podcast later in the future. You know, hopefully in 100 years and a couple thousand years, like we're reading Marcus Aurelius' <laughs> book today, you know, who knows? Uh, but I love that advice and not needing to ask for permission. And I think courage, this thing of just taking action of, believing in yourself of being a little stubborn mm. at times is a great trait for entrepreneurship. I've always been super stubborn since I was a kid. And sometimes it wasn't a good trait, you know, in school and things like that. Right. Uh, but in all areas of life, like in sales, being persistent uh, and believing I could get this deal in business, in, in all these areas, being stubborn and just having that courage to believe in myself and just have that faith in myself has really served me well. So I love the advice of uh, you don't need to ask for permission. So. Thank you for sharing that. I really thought you're going to say idea validation again. <laughs> but uh but that's good. Final thing before we leave here, where can everybody find you and uh where would be the best place to contact you if anybody wants some help with course creation or their business? Yeah, so please uh contact me on Twitter where I'm at Craig Shoemaker. Uh just how it how it sounds. Um, and I, I'd love to have you come and join me over at the Leverage 3 podcast. If you sign up for the list there, I'm uh, working on getting exclusive content. There's pieces of the interviews that I don't put publicly that are available to people on the list. So yeah, it'd be great to connect with, uh, with anyone. That's awesome. Everybody check him out. He's one of the guys that inspired me to get into uh, podcasting sooner than later. So uh, he shared a ton of great wisdom with me. And uh, in terms of Twitter, we'll talk about that on a different conversation as well. But Greg, thank you so much for your time. I got a lot of value out of this. I'm sure everybody else did as well. And uh, we'll have you back on soon. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.